That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the first Navigation Committee meeting of 2022. Uh, my name is Simon Sparrow. I'm the Vice Chair of the uh, Navigation Committee. I'm standing in for Nikki Talbot, who can't be here today. Uh, just to remind everyone, the meeting is going to be conducted in accordance with the standing orders uh, for procedures for remote meetings. Uh, we've got all the committee. We've got most of the committee members in attendance, along with uh, several officers who are going to be presenting uh, some of the various agenda items. Um, this meeting's uh, live streamed at the moment. Uh, it's also been recorded, uh, so it can be accessed from the Broads Authority website. Just so okay. okay. Um, moving on to item number one. Uh, apologies for absence. We've received a uh, John Ash and Nikki Talbot. Now, I think we need to do the declarations of interest, agenda item number two. Are you happy to do that, Essie? Yes, of course. Thank you. So, um, first person is Linda Asplund, please. Nothing to declare, thank you. Mike Barnes? Uh, nothing to declare other than a private talk. Thank you. Harry Blathwaite? No added interest in this agenda thank you Stephen Bold nothing to declare Matthew Bradbury no interest to declare Andy Hamilton I'm not quite sure has he arrived yet I don't think he has so Andy Hamilton is not present Leslie Mockford is not present neither then we move on to Greg Manford yeah um, present and uh, I have an interest in item 11 as a higher boat operator. Okay, thank you. Simon Sparrow? Uh, present, uh, I have an interest in item 11 as well as a higher boat operator and I'm also interested in item 8 uh, as the owner of a larger boat that's tried to get into Norwich. So there's some discussion there. Thank you. Paul Thomas? Uh, nothing to declare apart from being a private toll pair. Thank you. And uh, ultimately, Alan Thompson. Nothing to declare. OK, thank you very much. That's everyone, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, item number three is to note whether any items have been proposed as matters of urgent business. Uh, none have been received. So we can take that one off. Item number four public question time to note whether any questions have been raised by members of the public. None have been raised. We can take that off. Item number five is to confirm the meeting, uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of October of 2021. There have been circulated and some comments incorporated. Uh, does anyone have any objections to these minutes? Okay, there's no objections. So I think we can record those as correct and available to be signed. And moving on to agenda item number six, a summary of actions and outstanding issues uh, following discussions at previous meetings. Um, I'd like to introduce John Packman, who's going to take us through this section. Uh, if you wait until John's kind of given us an update and then we have a chance to ask questions at the end. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think there are three little updates for, for members from this report. Um, the first is on the Borough Castle moorings, where the, the lease is still with the landowner's solicitor, and uh, we're chasing that and hope to resolve that as soon as we can. On the landscapes review, those members who've watched the online briefing will know that the publication of the government's response is imminent. And um, we, um, there will be a 12-week consultation period with a series of questions for us to answer. So we are arranging a member workshop, and it would be good to have all members there, including our co-opted members of the Navigation Committee. We're looking for a date uh, towards the end of February, and uh, as is circulated a doodle poll. So we'll, we'll try and get as many members to, to that as possible to that workshop. Um, and then on the Carrow Road Bridge repairs, uh, there's actually a note in the Chief Executive's report, so we can pick that up there. 
But if there are any other issues, any other matters relating to this that members want to raise, I and the team will do our best to answer them. Thank you, I, Thank you, John. I had a, a question just about the, the bridges, because there was going to be some remedial work done by Network Rail on them, which was delayed slightly. Do you guys have any updates on that? Uh, Rob, do you have a, the latest information on that? Uh, yes, good morning all. I do. The um, the issue was uh, was delayed because the, as you know, if you work on a railway line, you have to have a possession order, and the um, the rail company and the track owners couldn't agree uh, when when the possession would take place. So the consultants and the contractors who are doing the work have continued to do the planning, but it has slipped into to later on this year. So they are still planning on doing the work. The money's still available. It's just behind the scenes they're trying to sort out when the track can be possessed by the um, the contractors. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Does uh, anyone else have any other questions about these items? No? Okay. All right. If we um, move on to agenda item number seven, which is the Chief Executive's report, uh, again, I'll introduce you and then we can ask questions at the end. Thank you, John. So, thank you, Chair. So, the first item is a little update from the last last Broads Authority meeting when you see that members of the authority adopted the recommendations that the Navigation Committee put forward in terms of the setting of navigation charges for the coming year. Uh, on the Barton Turf stays there is a, a little update there and we're continuing our discussions with the Parish Council about that short length of mooring. Um, and then thirdly on Carrow Road Bridge we had a very productive meeting involving Norfolk County Council and Norwich City Council. And you can see that the County Council have agreed to have another look at how they might repair the bridge without locking it tight over the next couple of years. But that's been really very welcome um, and does relate to um, the presentation that you'll get from Callie and Graham Nelson in terms of the Norwich um, East development. Um, so that's my little update from that. But if there are any questions from members, I and the team will do our best to answer them. Did you have a, I think Paul, Paul Thomas, did you have a question? No, I didn't. No, <laughs> Mike, Mike's got uh, his hand up, not me. Oh, sorry, Mike's got <laughs> his hand up. I saw yours come up briefly, but uh, maybe it's the way it's just, right, Mike. Yes, hello. Um, right, it's about Barton Turf. Um, I, I fully endorse the the authorities' stance on this, based on the previous decisions that have been taken that we shouldn't be paying high leases for very little return. And I think that um, at the end of the day, if we if we're seen to be doing this hard with um, whichever parish council it is there at Barton Turf. Um, it might encourage the others to be a bit more sensible in the future because I appreciate money short in the public sector, but I don't think parish councils are as badly hit as district councils and county councils in terms of shortage of funds. Um, the thing that concerns me about it, however, is I, I don't know that the mooring is that brilliant, having been there and seen it, but the thing is we will end up losing a water point if we give it up. Um, whether there's an alternative that we can run a, a pipe brown to to Gay Stave or, or wherever, I don't. Oh, um, no, it's Paddy's Lane, isn't it? I'm talking about. Mm. I I don't know whether that's feasible or not, um, because at the end of the day, I think it's appropriate that water facilities should be available. Uh, thank you for the comments, Mike. Um, we we are continue our discussions with the parents council in 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 the context of the strategy that we've agreed with the navigation committee and you're right to point out that we need to hold to that because um, if we gave way on one particular location in terms of paying a rent when we that wasn't warranted that would have huge implications for the costs to the navigation um, across the whole system Exactly. Um, so uh, thank you for that support. In terms of the water point, I'll ask Rob to respond to that particular issue. 
Yes. Uh, so, as John explained, negotiations are still ongoing. So, um, you know, it's not uh, it's not a done deal by any any account. But if if the if it does come down to the the fact that that mooring is lost because we can't negotiate, then we would look to try and find something to, else to support the water point. So there are a number of options. Paddy Lane is one of them, but there is other irons in the fire that we're looking at. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, John. Uh, Harry. I think you've got a question. Just quickly on that, um, I think Cox's Yard have a uh, water point literally just across the, the water, so uh, I don't think it's a major issue. No. Thanks, Harry. I, I wondered that myself, actually. I've only been up there once, but it was lovely. Uh, Barton took one of my favourite places, but I think um, there's a reasonable chance, even if we can't, reach agreement with the Broads Authority will probably still remain a mooring, but just maybe run by the parish council. So those facilities may still be there for boaters. But let's hope we can reach agreement. Um, got a couple of other people with questions. Uh, Andy Hamilton? Yeah, I mean, I, I spend a fair amount of time up at Barton Turf. Um, and whilst Coxes do have water on their yard, I'm not sure they're particularly welcoming of hire boats or, or non-people who don't moor there. Um, so I think you need to be careful assuming that there's a, there's a, a water point at Cox's. Okay, thanks. Andy, welcome. Um, can you indicate whether you've got any um, declarations of interest for this meeting no, before? No, no declarations other okay. than normal. Thank you very much, Andy. Great. I'm sorry for being late. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, any other questions on the Chief Executive's report? I think it looks pretty good. All right, we're on to agenda item number eight, which I think is going to be quite interesting. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Graham Nelson and Callie Smith. You guys would like to take us through it, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if Sarah or Essie would like to, Sarah or Essie would like to put up the first slide, that would be really helpful. That can tell us, locate us, show us where we start. So, East Norwich Master Plan, Graham Nelson, Kelly Smith, I'll start, then Graham will talk on the production of the master plan and then we'll come back to me and I'll talk about the implications uh, and run you through the details of the report that, I, that, that you've got before you. So next slide please and let's see where we are and make a couple of points um, about this location. So uh, let me just make that as big as I can on my screen so I can uh, point it. So so here we are um, on the edge of so as big as I can get. Right, okay. So here we are in Norwich. We've got the River Yare running through here. That, that's the air, isn't it? That's the new cut. Then it the Yare travels down south, becomes Wensum here at Trouse Eye. Um, we're coming the river travels right up into the city centre, as we know, and the three sites are some of the some of the first land that we approach as we come into Norwich. To the north of the river, there was a big gas holder there. There were electricity pylons on the site. It's been empty, derelict for 30, 40 years long long time there's a lot of railway infrastructure there are uh, where the trains change where the lines branch off there are some engine sheds so that's what we call the utility site river comes down there's where the wensum goes off we've got carrow yacht club on this corner here and then we've got the deal ground site the deal ground site has probably been empty for the best part of 30 years uh once upon a time it's a sort of big loading point uh for, for wood coming into Norwich um used to make uh used to make things as well for the for the Coleman's factory once upon a time a uh, very very busy site it's been empty for a long time it's been cleared in recent years um and then to the west of that we've got the Caro work site that was occupied until very recently a couple of years ago it was occupied by Coleman's um and then the subsequent incarnations of that company, people will remember the, the 
food manufacturing there it was always a very busy site um employed a lot of people locally but regrettably um has, has been closed for a number of years the river fronts it here as we can see and of course we've got mm -hmm up opposite um, and then we've got Carrow Bridge here. We're just west of Whitling and Broad, um, the large broad there, the smaller broad there um, and what's really interesting to note here is the location of these sites at the at the point where the city really starts to sort of blend into the countryside. The big recreational area that is Whitling and Broad and the country park here is, is pretty close, very close by river. It's a bit further if you want to go around by road and we'll talk about that in a second but also these sites are very very close to the city centre we can see the city centre there the castle the cathedral's a little further out um but very very close so we're within 10 minutes by river of the countryside if you could walk it it wouldn't be a great deal further and within 15 20 minutes of walking to the city centre so we really are in quite a unique location um county hall roundabout here is worth noting because that's where a lot of the traffic comes into norwich from this side comes off the southern bypass here so it's useful to sort of make a note of all the links that we've got here if we go on to the next slide we'll come in a little bit closer and we'll review some of those links again so thank you very much here we've got the county hall roundabout um that's sort of quite important because it's one of the it's it's the point where most of the traffic particularly coming to these southern sites would have to access it it would have to come down here through trouse and those of you that know this will know that that's not a fantastic piece of road um and that the county hall roundabout itself is a very busy roundabout and is already operating at capacity it's the main roundabout off which you get access into the Caro work site which is here at A. You then have to come down over the little bridge um, to come down to get access into the deal ground site. That's the only road access that we've got into the deal ground site. You can't get to it across the river at all. If we look to the north, to the deal ground site, here we've got that at sea. There's no access to that site currently from the south by road, and there's actually very little access. Um, yeah, there's no access from the south by road, and there's actually very little access by road even from the north. There's a little bridge here um, that's a, that's a, that um, is signal controlled, and that gives access just to traffic that's coming to the site associated with the railway and associated with the other activities that have taken place here. Um, it's a very... Hmm? Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Callie, but I... I just want to check. I can no longer. See, I can see everyone uh, as individual attendees, but I can no longer see the slides on my screen. I'm just checking. Is everyone else able to see the slides? I can't. Oh, okay. If I if I've it's got, just me, then that's fine. Good. I've got the slides. I can't. Right. Sorry, okay. it's just obviously something with my um, iPad and Teams. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So it's quite important that you see these slides. Um. So how many people cannot see them? I I can't see them, but um, you can't. No, Linda, did you say you can't? I can't. I just uh, got your, your standard Brady Bunch view of everyone taking part. Mm, okay, might, might, uh, be, might be a function an issue with iPads. I'm not sure because I'm not on an iPad. It, yeah, I'm on an iPad, so it, I saw the first one, but then the second one disappeared. So, it's, if most people can see them, then you know, I think we could carry on. The only thing I think uh, you could do is maybe turn them off and turn them on again and see if that resets it. <laughs> yeah, I can try that. Or um, are you able to email the... I was going to say if I could email yeah, them. Email the slides. Yeah, that, email them yeah, yeah that yeah. might be a good way. Because it's really important that you yeah, see these. It just might take me a um, couple of minutes behind the scenes. <laughs> that's fine. So Thank if you, that's if, if I leave that one up, but just bear with me, if you say next slide, I might just be emailing. So just bear with me. OK, well, what we're looking at here is we're looking at a slide um, of Norwich. So we've got uh, it's not dissimilar to the last one. We've just zoomed in a little bit further. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the utility site to the north. I'm pointing out the fact that there's no access to it from the south. There's no access over the river um, other than for the trains. Uh, and on trains. 
Montrass Rail Bridge. To the north, there is a there's a there's a single track bridge that goes over the railway line that is only available. That's not for public use. That is just for commercial use for for the workers or anybody accessing the utility site. Um, there has been talk in the past about improving that bridge, but given the width of the railway line and the density of the housing to the north, that's not really feasible. So access to the north is very, very, from the north is very, very severely constrained. There is an access along the river. So there is a bridge that goes under the railway line um, and comes out by Lawrence and Scott. Um, and that's an access that's not particularly well used at the moment. Again, it only really gives access into the utility site for workers, anybody going to that site. There's no public access in there, but that does potentially form an access to, to, to that site. So looking again, now I'm going back, Andy and Lynn, uh, Simon and Linda, to the deal ground site. You've got no access to that from the north. The access from the south is um, from the main road that goes down through Trous, um, and then there is an access into that site. Um, but that all comes off the County Hill roundabout. And then if we go back to site A, which is the Carrow Works site, that is accessed um, there's a number of accesses to that, but primarily they're down by, again, by the County Hall roundabout. There's another access off Brackendale, but that's that's very much a secondary access. So we can see that these sites are quite heavily constrained by access to them. This would be one of the reasons that they've, they've proved so problematical in terms of redevelopment over the years. But what we do see here and I've alluded to this in the in the first slide, is just how close they are to so many other facilities. If you could get access through them, pedestrian access, cycling access, road access, they've got, they got the potential to have very good links and connections, both with the city centre and the, and the urban area and with the countryside. So if you could get, if you could achieve an access through them, they've got the potential to make it an awful lot easier to, to, to link, link these areas up for public use. So the next slide is, oh, sorry. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say on that one was um, that the uh, deal ground site is the larger of the sites at 14 hectares. The utility site is 12 hectares um, and the Caro work site um, is is, a, is about the same, is, is about 12, 14 hectares as well in total. So if we go on to the next slide, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, this gives us an aerial photo um, and you can see the existing uses here. If we look, let's take the deal ground site here, which is this one. We've got the Carrow Yacht Club here. The majority of the site is unused, has been unused for a long time. It's been cleared in recent years um, and we've got a county wildlife site here on this eastern side and that's actually very important to note. Part of that is, uh, or a large part of that is actually in the functional floodplain um, and that's going to be very important when we start to look at the constraints of the site. If we then go west to the Carrow Works site, what you can see here along the river front are a lot of a lot of his, a lot of old old buildings. These are the traditional brickwork buildings, very attractive. Um, so they form some of the old warehouses, some of the old office buildings, um, and they've been identified as a heritage asset that, that's that's worth preserving as part of the historic character of the riverfront of the city. There are some newer buildings that you can see here um, that are, don't don't have a, a great deal of value as as in the urban um, landscape. Um, so there's quite a lot of potential on this site, but again, there are buildings that need to be retained. If we go up to the utility site, again, much of that is now empty. There was electricity pylons there. They have been moved um, and this eastern corner of the site um, is more natural and, and that's, that's got quite a lot of um, quite a lot of vegetation and growth on it, which in itself sort of offers some potential for some screening. Um, 
The other thing I want to draw your attention to is this area here, um, and this is an aggregate uh, facility. It's, it's located adjacent to the railway line, and historically that's been used as a loading and unloading depot um, for, for a for the road for a roadstone company um they don't at this in at this stage intend to move so that is very much a, a site that has had to be worked around in the development of the master plan so what we can see here is we've got some large sites they've got quite a lot of they've got quite a lot of limitations quite a lot of constraints the major constraints really do relate to sort of the access both from them and to them um but over, overall, they represent quite a uh, quite a lot of opportunity for the redevelopment in the east part of Norwich. Um, the Broads Local Plan um, has got a policy in it which identifies part of the utility site. This green line that you can see is the Broads Authority boundary. So this area here on the utility site is the only part of these three sites which is in the Broads Authority boundary. Um, but a because the Broads area is adjacent to the larger sites, we've obviously got an interest in what happens on those sites. And the adopted policy from May 2019 states that redevelopment of this area will be sought to realise its potential contribution to the strategic needs of the wider Norwich area. This site is allocated for mixed use development, which could include around 120 uh, dwellings, but development redevelopment proposals will only be supported where they don't prejudice a comprehensive and deliverable mixed use scheme for the whole of this whole of this area. So that policy effectively ties what happens here in the Broads area into what happens into the wider area. In addition to that, not only must it link into a comprehensive redevelopment, but it must also not impede the navigation of the rivers Yare and Wenson. So that's what the Broads Authority policy says, the Adopt Broads Local Plan policy. Um, the Greater Norwich uh, Development Partnership are putting together the Greater Norwich Local Plan and that has been recently been submitted for examination. There's a policy in here which Graham will talk you through, but in principle what that says is these sites are being put forward for redevelopment, but that redevelopment uh, must be uh, must be set out in a master plan, uh, which must be the subject of consultation, and that identifies broadly 6,000 new jobs, 4,000 new dwellings across the whole of the area to be set out in a master plan to, to be developed. Um, that's broadly where we've got to with stage one master plan, and this is the point at which I can pass over to Graham um, and he can talk about the development of the master plan. Graham, I can leave you with this or we can put you over to the next couple of slides which show the overall, um, the, the, the character areas, and then there's one that shows the overall master plan, whichever you would like. Uh, for the uh, at the initial stage, can you just take down the slide presentation because it's it's quite useful for me just to be able to see the reactions of people to some what I say, and then when I sort of boring people rigid or uh, or or potentially so it's helpful so if we can see and read people's faces. Can I start by um, saying thank you very much for the invite to come and speak to you about this uh, and introduce myself. I'm Graham Nelson. I'm Director of Development and City Services for Norwich City Council. Um, been there since uh, 2008 in various guises and have been living with these sites for quite some time, um, particularly the deal ground and the utility site have both been allocated effectively through the previous joint core strategy and previous to that through the 2004 City of Norwich local plan. If you look at government guidance and if you look at everything, it's a bit of a no brainer. Um, the brownfield sites, if you go back to the 50s, they were industrially developed. Everything about government guidance tells you these are exactly the sort of sites that ought to be being brought forward for redevelopment. It's not that easy. There are some major problems and it's a real.
wonderful opportunity for the city, but we've got to get it right. Getting it right involves considerable degree of partnership working and potentially considerable degree of effectively public, public subsidy to deliver something that probably will not happen without some form of public intervention. So frankly, for the past 15 years, we've We've done various things. There's a consent in place on the deal ground for some 680 homes that covers part of South Norfolk District, as well as parts of the city and um, was linked to a previous bridge proposal that, amongst other people, was approved by the Broads Authority. Bridge has now let, uh, lapsed. Um, so that principle was established, as I say, utility site is allocated uh, and people may remember the Norwich Powerhouse proposal that came forward a few years ago for a power station on the site that an application was submitted to both us and the Broads Authority, um, which actually was withdrawn undetermined when the applicant effectively went bust a few years ago. Um, so various efforts have been made to try and redevelop both the utilities site and the deal ground site over the past decade. They've both come to naught so far, um, insofar as both of those sites are sitting there largely underused. And as Gally's just explained, they are brownfield sites. They have certain locational advantages, access disadvantages. But overall, if you take a step back, they are far closer and far more accessible to the city than many of the current sites that are being looked at, both through the Joint Core Strategy and the Greater Norwich Local Plan for peripheral expansion of the city. If you take a step back and look at it from a sort of bird's eye view, the areas of major growth, Northeast Growth Triangle, Southwest Corridor in Kringleford, up around Cossey, where all the housing is going in on predominantly greenfield sites, are far further from the city centre and have the potential, have far less potential to, for proper sustainable access than these sites we are looking at. In, a, in an effort to, you know, try and capitalise on what was undoubtedly a body blow to the Norwich economy with the frankly unwelcome closure of the Carrow Works when Britvic Unilever pulled out and there was that hit on employment. What we've tried to do is form a partnership arrangement to take forward um, a wider look at this area of the city to try and knit together the urban, the urban area with the Broads Authority area and try and not only deliver a quite what hopefully will be a remarkable place in its own right that is really well located in relation to the city, but try and do that in a way that creates a better interface between the city and the broads and delivers on a number of wider public benefits in terms of breaking down the barrier that the river does for connectivity in and around the city, creating a far better sense of arrival on the water to what you when you're coming into the city um, and also improving vastly the accesses to the recreational and other opportunities that the broads give that currently are harder to access for the 30 odd percent of the city who don't have ready access to the private car. Um, so it's particularly getting down to Whittlingham is, is not easy, is not welcoming on either bike or foot at the moment, and yet it is remarkably close. So there's an entire urban population that feels slightly divorced from the broads to a certain extent. And as a city, you know, Norwich is really very proud that we are the only city in the UK that has a national park actually running into, into its core, but we don't actually make the most of that opportunity that it gives us. And through things like the River Wensum um, management strategy that we've recent that we adopted a few years ago and we've been working away with I have to say very the very active involvement of the Broads Authority on improving access to the river things like that we're gradually working at it 
to improve. So, you know, the canoe portages that have gone in up and new moves to link together the access from the upper Wensum down to the lower Wensum. There is gradually an uptick in the use of the river and the recognition of what the river can bring to Norwich, but it still has a way to go. There are still a number of derelict and underused sites down by the river that need to be brought forward for development. There is still further access points that can be done and further improvements to that to actually so the city can benefit from the the river and the broads and what it brings and then Norwich is seen as more of a destination and actually as part of the broads that in my plain language is what sort of the strategy is about that we're trying to work through the issue that we've got now is following the you know caro works becoming effectively derelict uh, we've now got an opportunity to galvanize at some scale uh, a, a master plan set out an opportunity work with uh, both the public sector and the private sector partners that have an interest to actually make it happen and the key risk that we find in this process will be that if we if we're still sitting and having these discussions in 10 years time or 20 years time and nothing has happened on the site then we failed and that's the key risk we need to guard against we actually have a real opportunity with how government is working particularly the encouragement of homes england you can look nationally at other parallel examples and how much the government has invested to unlock brownfield sites for sustainable development there's a we've we've taken a lot of advice from homes england about the master plan and the process that we're going through here it's worth drawing a parallel with some of the unlocking activities that Homes England did in York Central. They funded York Central redevelopment to the tune of £77 million to unlock a roundabout opportunity for 4,000 homes. Think through that and think that this is a nationally important, indeed certainly regionally important scale of redevelopment. And if we get the master plan right and we keep the unanimity of the partners around support for it, we stand a fighting chance of being able to get significant resources to ensure that an appropriate level of infrastructure, social facilities, etc., is provided up front and early. And that has a number of highly strategic advantages to the city. And I would hope you see those from the Broads Authority perspective, because I think some of those provide strategic benefits to yourselves, to navigation, uh, to waterway use and some of your purposes as well, in addition to unlocking something that will have quite significant local benefit. So that was some of the background, the thinking that led to the, the, the East Norwich Partnership being formed a couple of years ago on the basis of a sort of vision document that the city council commissioned when the when we knew that the Caro works was becoming derelict uh, was becoming un, unused and was going to be disposed the partnership comprises all the landowners who have uh, an interest in the site at the moment that includes uh, the city council as a landowner because as people may be aware we've recently purchased the site of Caro House which we are refurbing at the moment because we didn't want further fragmentation of ownership and we're trying to deliver things using the town's deal to create some buzz around the office location in the city so we're driving that forward and to a certain extent have put our money where our mouth is to try and give ourselves more of a scope here but the, the number of private sector owners are relatively limited two two owners on the utilities site uh, one owner of the deal ground effectively one owner of the caro works site outside of the city council uh, all of those are actively involved in the partnership that we've formed and are funding it 
as indeed are Network Rail, who are the only other significant landowner with holdings in the area who are also actively involved in the partnership. The public sector partners include both the Broads Authority, uh, the other councils in the area, so South Norfolk particularly have an interest because it's not just limited to the boundary of the City Council, uh, and the County Council are actively involved in the partnership, both in their role as highway authorities, because as Callie's explained, the, and as we all know, the road network in the area is constrained and has certain limitations to it, but also they've got a very active interest because of the railhead that Kelly mentioned and the uh, and the ability to, um, um, you know, th they need that for the minerals and waste purposes and it's safeguarded in their minerals plan. So it's administratively complicated, but we've got their active involvement of all the necessary public partners on the partnership. And we've then, we then went through a recruitment process effectively and brought in a firm of consultants who spent most of this year doing consultants and doing con consultation and engagement work, including with many, well, I hope, boating, Whitlingham people, everything else. We've cast the net quite wide in terms of engagement to harvest views to come out with the stage one master plan at this stage. Um, that's probably an appropriate point to pause. I don't know. I don't know how you want to handle this chair. If you were to pause now for any sort of general strategic questions or whether you want the, to, the, those plans coming from the emerging master plan about the character of the area to be shared and me talk through those. Uh, thanks, Graham. I think, does anyone have any sort of questions at this point? Or do you want to some more information? Uh, looks like a couple of people have got questions. Who have we got? Uh, Matthew Bradbury. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Um, <clears throat> Callie and, uh, and Graham as well for um, really interesting uh, um, uh, presentation and uh, certainly pleased to see the town's deal level, essentially levelling up funding, having such a potentially positive impact on the, on the city. I, I chair the town's deal board for Peterborough and, uh, you know, I, I've been calm stop being impressed by the, the, the progress that uh, Norwich is making under Andrew Durney's uh, leadership uh, of the Townsdale Board. So um, congratulations there. The point I wanted to make though was 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 probably more around the um, the opportunity that, that there is here for influencing um, a very positive 21st century um, opportunity for placemaking, um, particularly given the point that Graham was making about the fact that we are unique in that we're the only city with a national park that kind of um, uh, uh, you know comes into it. So I think I think um, taking the opportunity to to link with 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 um, the Broads Authority area, taking the opportunity to consider the benefits that could be offered to tourism to um, enhance navigation rather than not impede it, I think was the expression that um, uh, was used by um, Cali earlier on in terms of our policy at the Broads Authority. And I think, you know, there's a massive opportunity, I think, for, uh, you know, looking at the way staycations and, and, and looking at the way people are now holidaying to, to take the opportunity to bring more of that tourist economy into Norwich City Centre uh, and to make the most of that. And I think um, also to to offer the spectacle of larger ships coming back into the city centre. So I think we shouldn't forget those as as maybe um, uh, priorities going forward. I think there's also a, a really amazing opportunity now, particularly linked to Whitlingham. Um, and one of the things I'm particularly concerned about is actually the impact, the potential negative impact on Whitlingham uh, by having a huge number of additional chimney pots uh, close by um, and, um, and looking at the opportunities for sill, biodiversity net gain, carbon sequestration um, and, 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 you know, developing a, a real, bringing Whitlingham into the development of that placemaking, I think is incredibly important, putting good quality linked green space in to the developments, I think will also encourage people to, to navigate their way into the city centre, I think it'll improve um, the opportunities for us to be able to deal with the climate emergency 
um, as part of that whole whole picture. So I suppose what what I it's rather a statement rather than a question. But Graham, I suppose the question that comes at the end of that is, can you reassure us that all of those things are being considered very carefully as part of the development of the master plan? Um, thank you for that. And the vast majority of what you've you've just outlined i'm i'm wholly on 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 board with particularly the role that andrew Durney is playing in assisting a whole range of partners moving forward the town steel and just just before we get back into the detail of what you've mentioned that 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 sort of activity of government and the fact that we are able to to bid for and draw down funding like that actually gives me more confidence that we've got the mechanism and people locally to engage with government and bring be able to secure we're seen as a good investment proposition by government and keeping that but gives us a real fighting chance of being able to secure further monies from the uh, um, from the leveling up fund tra as it enrolls it as it unravels, we've got a reputation in government through the Towns deal as a place that can deliver. And so it's an opportunity for us to capitalise on that. But what you need is we can't go off Pete. It needs that partnership. It needs the unanimity of the key partners in the area to galvanise behind a particular solution. And that's what Andrew Durney has been able to deliver to date through his uh, role as chair of the Towns deal board. The points that you've made uh, around uh, placemaking uh, are very well made, particularly the Carrow Works has a legacy of historic buildings there. Uh, it is unique in the country, uh, frankly, that's the only modern industrial food plant that existed with a Benedictine Abbey at its core and some, <laughs> some, some heritage legacy that is Frankly, is phenomenal. It has the 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 ma has a massive ability to create a place like no other, because of that. And and it's 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 a mixture of you know a medieval heritage on the site, but it's got this most fantastic industrial heritage in terms of how the sort of our equivalent to Port Sunlight, if you like. Bourneville has grown up with the social ethos of the Coleman's family coming through it. The the fact that they've got a pet cemetery, they've got their old schools, there was a war memorial to the Coleman's workers who died in the First World War. Everything's there as well as this Victorian industrial legacy. So it's it's Norwich through the ages in a microcosm there and it's we're going through a process and we've we've recently as part of the master plan process funded historic england to effectively refresh all of the listing entries so we've got we will shortly be publishing effectively a comprehensive inventory of all the heritage assets that are on the site all up to date ranging from the world war ii at air raid shelters the modern industrial buildings they so the pet cemeteries and some of the domestic architecture that's on the site where the Coleman's used to live to have a comprehensive record that's going to give us a major advantage in actually treating that quite remarkable place. Now, as you wind development forward for the master plan and look at the amount of housing and other forms of development that can come alongside that through conversion, through clearance and demolition of the buildings that are no, no longer have any use and through reuse of the Daryl and Field sites. In planning the detail of that, if you're planning on the basis of this being linked in as a comprehensive redevelopment for instance, with access to Whitlingham, that changes the amount of development that you can deliver on the site. Because clearly, if there are areas of open space and a country park of the standard of Whitlingham, that increases the developmental area, overcomes problems of viability, and actually creates a legitimate case for the planning authority to say, well, hold on, you're, you're you're benefiting from this, there needs to be some not only capital coming in to fund the bridges, etc., to provide the access, but some level of assistance to the ongoing management costs that may be faced by the fact that uh, 
I don't think the development will have chimney pots, to be frank, but I know what you mean exactly by it, by the fact that you've got a far larger number of people on their doorstep who are going to be walking their dogs, jogging, going around for a bike ride, doing whatever. That'll increase the wear and tear on paths. And actually, in practical terms, it, it may actually reduce the number of people because it's got opportunities for the people who currently go and park and pay for their parking to go via other things. So it may reduce certain aspects of income. Through the mechanism set up the appropriate management companies of the development etc you've got a way of addressing that i can't sit here and give you any assurance about what the outcome of that process will be clearly it's commercial negotiations but what i can give you is an assurance that matters such as that absolutely will be looked at and when we get through to the later phases of the master plan will provide clear guidance about what the expectations is so that we're not frankly shafting someone like uh, Whitlingham Country Park for a better expression. Great, thank you very much Graham and Matthew. I think we've got uh, Paul and then Harry, so Paul if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, mine's, mine's just a very quick question, so thank you Simon. It was, it was really, um, I mean, I, I mean this is, you know, really exciting development for, for sure and, and um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> you know, you'll be able to get the, the right level of funding for as well and I think, you know, it's for sure, I think, you know, whenever you redevelop water sides, uh, it, it's obviously going to, you know, um, increase interest in the river and usage of the river. Um, but I, I guess my main question really is that I assume that this is all part of the kind of consultation process towards getting planning consent for the development. Uh, the short answer is this is done in advance of any detailed consultation that comes forward on the planning applications. Um, there's a as I mentioned, for the legacy issues, there's a consent already in place on part of the deal ground. That's broadly consistent with what the emerging master plan is. Whether anybody chooses to refresh it in the light of the consent would, in the light of the master plan, would be a matter for the landowner as it stands. Uh, in relation to where we are with the Carrow Works, the new prospective owner is in very initial stages of consultation with us as the local planning authority they're expecting to do formal pre-application consultation later this year but we've we've got this master plan available they're taking forward to inform that process which hopefully does a number of things hopefully sets out a clear set of requirements that developers must respond to but also sort of de-risks it to a certain extent for the landowner so it works on both directions provides that policy basis that hopefully that answers your question yes thank you cool thanks very much graham and paul um harry yeah, uh, Graham, this is amazing, uh, really exciting. Um, can I just ask you that uh, given the access issues of a major development on this site, that you don't lose sight of the river for commercial use, bringing the materials for the building site in? Uh, Yarmouth has a perfectly... <laughs> Has, uh, could unload at Yarmouth uh, and use the river to bring in materials uh, because that roundabout won't be able to cope with the amount, sheer amount of lorries use, I wouldn't have thought. So this is a real opportunity to use the river commercially. Um, I, I, I should also mention that I'm chair of the Broads Authority Heritage Asset Review Group and I, um, I, I was amazed that we weren't mentioning the Priory earlier. Uh, I, understand, I understand it's outside the Broads Authority area, but it is a major, major um, piece of our heritage, it, um, which is unknown because of its situation. Uh, and I would ask that uh, access from the river be given to the uh, to the what was the actually a nunnery it was um, the abbess uh, had a house so sumptuous it was recorded that it justified the dissolution on its own so I mean it is important it is and and you've got a mulberry tree there that is the oldest mulberry tree I think in the country 
uh, apart from the glorious Pep uh, Cemetery. So, I mean, yeah, I am really excited that more people will see these things than I have done before. Thank you. Oh, and Callie, um, can I suggest that if we are discussing this again at planning or, or, or at Heritage, perhaps we could use the conference facilities on the site uh, as a venue, so we could have a, a, a meeting uh, and a site visit at the same time. Um, perhaps that might be a good idea. Thank you very much. Um, can I just, before Callie comes back in, can I comment just on the last point? The public consultation and engagement events we did over the summer and into the autumn, we 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 opened up and persuaded the la the landowner to facilitate on the site, and we, so local people were able to get onto the site and see around the abbey and see and the actual events were held inside the abbess's house with its oak lined panel rooms and all the rest of it and for. There's quite a, a wide number of people were familiar with the site because a the county council used to use it as well as the Coleman's works, but effectively a lot of the local residents in that area are frankly are unaware of the value of the heritage assets and that remarkable asset that exists right in the middle of of, of Norwich effectively, and it's clearly one of our objectives to secure not only the future and safeguard the asset that exists, but to secure your public access to it long term going forward uh, and from our point of view that's 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 access for the wider city uh, and any member of the public who wishes to come and see those facilities uh, clearly there's a slightly separate issue around how you arrange access to the river but clearly this whole area is something that we're looking for the public to be able to pass and repass over and not be any sense of a private or gated development so clearly that's going to improve the attractiveness of the moorings, the marinas, anything else, and the access points on the river that we doubtless can create as part of this wider development. So hopefully that gives you some comfort that we're not, there's no way that navigators would be excluded from that general improved access and frankly celebration of a remarkable legacy of heritage that exists on the site. You're your previous point about the um, about making use of the river to bring through a building materials on a temporary basis to avoid some of the pressures on the road network. Um, happy to take away and have those discussions. Just don't want to um, don't want to give any false comfort that I think that that will necessarily be easy or straightforward to arrange. Happy for it to be looked at to try and encourage it in practice. Not sure that we will be able to require it. And whilst there are undoubtedly highway constraints on the network, to my experience that they can generally be resolved by timing of delivery issues. So I'm not sure that we'll be in a position to require temporary things but happy to have those discussions be looked at and see if we can bring in um, materials via non-traditional routes effectively or what well, might have been very traditional routes if you look at well the cathedral yeah. was delivered via stuff that was uh, boated up the river um, so yeah yeah the olympic uh, the olympic village in uh, london was brought in by river and canal so it, it, it isn't unknown in this day, uh, day and age no uh, and there's certainly practical advantages of doing it particularly if we get into the meat detail of of building on the utility sites and uh, and marinas if uh, it may be put I, I think it's probably very difficult to construct a marina on the utility site because of the constraints of road access to it at the moment which means a bridge needs to be built over the Wensum to enable it if you cannot get the materials delivered by a boat so it may be more practical on the utility site particularly than other aspects of the development right all right thank you very much um, Graham, you need to do the next stage of your presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to carry on if one wants to reshare the slides. I'll try and keep this brief because, as I say, I thought the main point of today was to give you the opportunity to um, to ask questions about 
where things are with it. And uh, I know Kelly has prepared a really helpful paper that highlights particularly a number of the navigation issues around around bridges, around uh, marinas, etc., and how the detail of that's going to be worked. The this plan, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to this, uh, Kelly, but this is from the emerging master plan that identifies sort of four different character areas. Uh, clearly, overall, the master plan has, has done a series of massing exercises in terms of looking at the heritage assets, the longer views, et cetera, and it's come up with issues of, of height and then has started working through at an initial stage what we might be talking about in terms of extent of employment use, retail use, um, supporting social and other community facilities that would needed for this scale of development. And then it's looked at the nature of housing and flats, etc. One thing that the we've been acutely conscious of is the Norwich market effectively has a certain um scaled to it so it, as, as the developers who i tend to speak to all the time talk, talking about absorption rates of the local market and you can see what you know the wet dock development in ipswich did if you bring too many flats particularly onto the market at one point in time you're in danger of saturating it and cannibalizing it and etc so what they're, they're looking at through these character areas is to try and um, find a way that within the different areas of the development, the the housing particularly that's brought forward reflects different characters, so appeals to different sectors of the market, which gives us a fighting chance of getting this built out actually quicker by having a mixture of housing and flats, having a mixture of different tenures, having a mixture of different characters appealing to different sections of the market. And that is very much driven by the characteristics of the site, with the Colmans and the heritage being reflected by the materials palette and the nature of buildings, particularly around the Coleman's house and the abbey we spoke about earlier with a potential for higher density development where the larger previously more industrial scale buildings fronted the water side with a different form of development that's more yeah, more informed by the, the sort of county wildlife site and the relationship to the River Yare and the marshes that exist um, in parallel with the Deal Ground and then finally the Waterside North, which I think is particularly key to establishing the interface between the city and the broads, that sense of arrival. Once you get into what feels like an urban city and how that works with the where the marina is going to be incorporated, the density, the heights of those buildings. So there's four different character areas that are proposed by the master planners for for discussion at this point. I don't know, Kelly, do you want to add anything on that? Are you happy if we move on to the next slide? Uh, no, I don't want to add anything to that. Just to say that this is being developed through a pretty standard urban design methodology where you look at the constraints in, in the first instance and then look at the surrounding area and start to I identify how you would how you would link in. Um, and it's interesting to look at this as a whole but also to identify the different areas and the way in which they respond to the areas that, that that they are that they're next to currently. The next couple of slides, Graham, then give us a little bit more detail of those particular areas. I think the first, the next one, really gives a bit more detail of the Caro Works site and the villages, um, and the text and takes the text from the from the uh, from from the master plan but i don't think we necessarily need to go through that because you've given such detailed explanation of of what we've got at the caro works um the deal ground site members will be a little bit more familiar with because of course we've looked at proposals there before um and as i said we've got a large part of the site probably 60 percent good 50 percent site anyway is in the functional floodplain which effectively means that that's a constraint and that wouldn't be suitable for development. In many ways, this is uh, this in a, this helps to create this interface between the city and the countryside because it gives us gives us a natural buffer zone um, and gives us a 
quite quite a nice clear edge to what would be the development and again that's something that we've seen in previous applications here but anyway i'll let you talk about this one on the next one if you've got anything else you want to say graham uh, what i suggest for brevity purposes and to avoid the death by powerpoint that i fear you skip over this slide and the next one because i think i've i said everything that probably needs to be covered about that and and the key thing is probably that is this the last slide this is the slide that shows the master plan i yep. then got what i've got one that shows uh the previous scheme that we that was considered here that showed an indicative marina on the deal ground site okay. if you go back to the master go, plan i think go that's back the to the previous one. one i think i think that's reference if if we need it in terms of the way things are moving on um and probably helpful just for the benefit of particularly the navigation committee to run through some of the key aspects of of what is illustrated on that plan which is um i think it's easiest to start by access issues so as as Kelly talked through, this area is constrained effectively by the inner ring road, which certainly on the stretch from County Hall roundabout up past the football club is frequently operating at or near its capacity, as people will be familiar with. Um, the roundabout provides ample capacity in its own right to access and egress the sort of carrow work site the constraint is more widely on the network beyond that and people will be aware the county council may have just adopted an updated version of the norwich transport strategy when it met in december that deals with some of these issues and is being taken into account but transport's been looked at um significantly as part of this and the master plan is effectively proposing a strategy that seeks to minimize the number of car trips that will be made as a result of this development by tight parking standards and by particularly encouraging uh, the, the cycling and walking with the close proximity to key assets in the in the city to minimize that need Need to travel and certainly travel significant differences and you can see that by the sort of key routes that are shown particularly east west south of the river wensum connecting at king street at the eastern end sorry at the western end of the development right across through um through where the number one appears on that screen through a tunnel that already exists beneath the railway on the south side that is at tight i would describe it as for cycle for a decent cycle and pedestrian scheme but the former foreman of the Caro works site did assure me in the 1970s he did take his ford capri through that particular site through that particular tunnel so it is approximately the width of a ford capri plus a couple of inches i would suspect he may have needed to move his wing mirrors in slightly to avoid damaging his paintwork uh, to do that but you can see a really strong connectivity is proposed east west across the site from 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 king street through to whitlingham and and then the principal vehicular access to the deal ground and the utility site comes from the south and off um yeah effectively across what i refer to as the may gurney site and where you remember the uh, the depot for may gurney used to be with a new bridge across the river yeah where the number seven is south of the site and clearly that isn't a navigable stretch of river so the proposal is for it to be fixed uh, with a spine road running north south across the deal ground crossing the river when some downstream of the trouse rail bridge um, at where the bridge is illustrated as number two to provide the principal vehicular access through to the utilities site secondary accesses 
can exist to the utility site both via the bridge level crossing to the north um, that's shown where the number eight is and also under the access under the railway on the north side of the river that exists uh, near where the number three is on the map that would connect into the riverside walk but both of those are heavily constrained for practical and um and sort of capacity issues the area the area of hardy road is a private road and obviously uh, lawrence scott are still an operational industrial facility there so uh, there's no right of access effectively for vehicles um the generally accessing the site across that land at the moment and particularly as Kelly mentioned the the housing north of of where eight is on that map um Cremorne lane and salisbury road i think it is it's tightly packed victorian houses that the road clearly doesn't have the capacity and then the junctions with thorpe lane thorpe road at the at the northern end of that are blatantly unsuitable for significant volumes of traffic so those accesses do have the potential for potential emergency vehicles secondary accesses but the primary vehicular access to the utility site needs to come from the south via that spine road that's illustrated on the map uh, other key bits of infrastructure particularly concerning uh, navigation that is shown on that map is the suggestion that a new pedestrian bridge should go across the river uh, upstream of the Trous Rail Bridge where number, let me just check my map, six is on the map. Um, and then the there is also provision within the master plan at number three for the land effectively to be safeguarded for the Trous Rail Bridge should it eventually need to be twin tracked for it to be done so. So clearly from the city council's perspective the longer term prospect of being able to relieve that constraint on the railway network and get a get a twin track bridge across the river wensum to provide the possibility of further enhanced and for, and more reliable rail services into norwich would be a major strategic advantage it clearly cannot be required or obligated as part of delivering three and a half thousand four thousand homes and this development that we're talking about but what we need to make sure is that this development doesn't prejudice the longer term possibilities of either of an enhanced trans rail bridge uh, be, being opened on the site um, and the final thing to mention, I think, I mean, I've mentioned the vehicular bridge that is proposed at number two, but the other thing is further downstream of the most downstream bridge crossing that network is 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 number 13, where you can see the significant scale marina that is proposed as part of the emerging master plan that's been um, Gally's paper details some of the the advice and the involvement of the broads authority in that that it might be worth discussing a bit further um number five there is the pedestrian and cycle bridge that would link in to whitlingham to uh, complete the connectivity east west across the site south of the wensum um and what was the only other oh yes the other point i probably ought to be up front and mention about it is that clearly in terms of the master plan it it is at this stage not clear on the requirement for opening in relation to bridges number two and eight that uh, are proposed now now there is clearly a relationship that's referred to in Kelly's paper between that certainly the provision of opening bridges at locations two and eight significantly would increase the capital cost of delivering them and would make the development essentially less viable but it would also increase the ongoing maintenance costs of those bridges 
that would be needed in 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 addition to the in vastly increasing the upfront capital and then when it comes to the Trouse rail bridge um, clearly that's a, a slightly different matter that bridge currently opens though for reasons I'm sure you're all familiar with is somewhat constrained in terms of its practical use um, and we do not know frankly what the additional costs of being able to provide a twin track um, moving lifting bridge that would still reflect would respect the right for navigation for higher vessels into the city of Norwich beyond it but it's difficult to see how the that wouldn't necessarily kill the idea of twin tracking the bridge in terms of the additional costs damaging the benefit damaging the cost benefit ratio to the point that it becomes uninvestable but we are still looking at those scale of things but certainly that's how i view it at the moment that's possibly a little incendiary but um how can i say i'm interested in your views um Kelly, have I missed a thing that you think I should have covered? Hang on. Uh, no, I don't think so. If any, if you want to take any questions now on anything you've said, and the chairman's happy, we can do that. And then I think I'd like to go on to talk. A, it's just in a little bit more detail about the issues for the navigation, about the issues potentially of the bridges, and about the marina, and raise some of the issues that are outlined in the report, plus a couple of other comments, and then open it up for members for their thoughts on that. Okay, my right. my my suggestion would probably sorry, chair, interrupting. My suggestion would be probably if you need to say anything, it's probably best for you to say anything because I think what I've said is going to lead to those questions, and it might be difficult to draw a line under the debate once it's started. Yes, uh, I think that's probably a good idea, Cal. If you want to say your contribution first, then we can have some general questions afterwards because you may answer questions that we have uh, with the information you're about to give us. OK, uh, well, thank you very much. That was a sort of useful outline of what the draft uh, master plan shows. Um, you did make the point, Graham, that this is not a planning application. I think we do need to underline that, but this indicates what the development opportunities are, taking account of the constraints. I think we've seen that there are a lot of interdependencies between the various different elements, particularly rate, relating to the issues of vehicle access and the fact that in order to develop the land on the north, you're going to have to get access from the south and that inevitably is going to be uh, is going to require some bridges um the, what bridge gets constructed will impact on the viability because obviously the fixed bridges are considerably um cheaper to construct got less cost implications than 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 opening bridges both in terms of the construction and the subsequent costs the bridges are really going to be the key to unlocking the potential for the development here um, but they in themselves have got a significant cost both a financial cost and a cost in terms of the navigation your navigation committee members will be very aware that the Broads Authority position has always been that the historic right of navigation into Norwich to the Turning Basin at Corporation Quay downstream of Foundry Bridge must be protected and that any new bridges must be opening bridges. And that's been the case for the two new bridges that have been constructed in recent years, both the Friendship Bridge and the Lady Julian Bridge. But as we say, there's a cost implication. Opening bridges are expensive. The land required, there's more land required, there's maintenance and there's the management costs. We've had previous discussions about the um, fixed costs, uh, about the acceptability of fixed bridges. And we've talked about this a number of times. We had discussions back in 2013 when we looked at the deal ground development um, and there was an outline planning permission granted there. That was for an opening bridge, but the discussions were well if that were to be converted to a fixed bridge what would be required in order to compensate that for that and we did look at the potential for a marina within the deal ground site 
We looked at it again then when we had the Generation Park application in. Um, and again, we considered the possibility of a marina there. That application, um, as Graham says, was withdrawn. There was a report to Navigation Committee in 2015 on fixed bridges. Um, and we actually did some design work um, on a 30 berth marina at the Deal Ground site, potentially to support um, either the Generation Park scheme or the Deal Ground scheme. Um, and Navigation Committee were not uncomfortable with that in principle, but there are a lot of details that we needed to discuss. Neither of those schemes ever came to fruition. So we're almost, you know, sort of back to where we were before. But for the reasons that Graham's outlined, particularly around the impetus for this, the national support for it and the funding that the City Council um, has managed to draw down and the partnership working, I think we're possibly closer to getting a scheme for the redevelopment of these sites than we've we've been before. So we need to look at this very, very carefully. There are discussions with Network Rail that are ongoing. You will know this, and John uh, has, has talked to you about this before, about the possibility of replacing the bridge deck with a twin, twin track um, to achieve Norwich in 90 potentially and improve viability um, and reduce the construction and maintenance costs associated with that bridge. When some design work was done some five, six years ago, 2015, that identified a cost differential between a fixed bridge and an opening bridge of around £15 million. And that number will, of course, have changed and it's unlikely to have gone down. So that gives you an indication of the sort of sums that we're looking at um, and the viability for this scheme is going to be difficult to achieve anyway because of the because of the um because of the constraints uh, and the costs of the infrastructure to address that and finally and more recently and bang up to date you got something on this in the chief executive's report we have of course also had the issue of the county council uh looking at carrow bridge and quite what they're going to do to address the issues there and they've proposed the two options one of which was of course to, to close was to well, the bridge closed and the Broad Authority has rejected the reasonableness of this and there are discussions ongoing um, as to how that's going to be addressed. Looks likely that that decision has now been put off. So that's perhaps gone a couple of years down the line. So potentially um, there are some costs there and potentially some cost savings which might come into play when we start to look at how any bridges and how any marina might get funded. Were um, any proposals to come forward for a fixed bridge and if they were to be supported by the Broads Authority, it would be necessary to repeal the Trouse Bridge Act before any of these proposals could be implemented. And that process would be likely to be via a Transport and Works Act order. There'd be a lot of consultation on that. And that process isn't going to be a quick process if that's the decision that the authority decided it wanted to take. So it's, it's, it's there's certainly a lot of benefits in starting to get a steer on where we might want to go with that as early as possible so that we could start to get those processes underway. So in summary, the master plan as a whole is really dependent on the new bridges to create linkages, um, both to get the critical mass for the development, to make it viable and to attract funding. The design of the bridge isn't for the master plan, um, but a fixed bridge, I think it's fair to say, is likely to be the preference because of the cost, the land tax the maintenance and all the ongoing issues. The, the implications of a fixed bridge are quite clearly it would sterilise the port of Norwich. It would result in the loss of the historic right of navigation. It would impede access to high bridged and fixed mast craft and it may impact on Norwich Yacht Station. But I think it's very important to note, whilst we're mindful of these issues, it's very important to note that those bridges don't open easily now. Now, that's not an excuse. It's a matter of fact, they don't open easily now. So all the vehicles that are currently able to get easily into Norwich would still be able to get in. And it would not be unreasonable to set a fixed um, soffit height for any new fixed bridges that didn't impede um, the access through the navigation any more than it is now by the fact that those bridges don't actually open. And there's also through this the opportunity 
i.e. the funding to provide new facilities and potentially improve offers, not just to existing boaters, but to future boaters and to the wider population of the area, both to access between the broads and the city and get more people out on the water. We have looked previously um, at what the what the minimum mitigation requirements would be um, if we were to consider a fixed bridge. Um, we would want to be uh, we would want a new facility, a marina facility, something like that. Actually, Sarah, could you move the slides through a couple? I think we've got one that shows that part of the site, not that one. Uh, is it that one? Pot yeah, no, back, please. Back, please. Yes. So we can have a look at. No, nope. next one. That was the deal, Grant. Excellent. Fantastic. Here we are at slide 13. So this is what's proposed in the master plan indicated that it would be achieved, uh, that it would be possible to construct a marina basin on the eastern part of the site. This basin, as indicated, is about 35 metres wide. It's about 130 metres long, and it's estimated that it could, prob it could accommodate around 50 vessels. So if we look at what we've indicated before would be the minimum um, um, mitigation, we would want something that would have close proximity to Norwich, it would need to have good facilities and links both to the immediate area, to the river and to the facilities beyond. It would need to provide an attractive destination in its own right. There should be offline mooring berths with a mix of short stay visitor and permanent private moorings and then the facilities that boaters would require in terms of toilet and shower facilities, water and pump out, electric hookups um, and potentially it would be advantageous to have online moorings as well. And there are opportunities within this scheme for that with up to 600 metres on the north, 700 metres on the south bank and potential there. There should also be uh, slipway facilities for smaller craft um, and certainly there's the opportunity within this scheme for that. I think overall um, your officers are satisfied um, on balance that the master plan proposals broadly achieve those requirements in principle but I think that there's a lot more detail that would be required and we would be looking to develop those through stage two of the master plan development. We would want to be looking at, I mean we've got the broad outline of the size of the marina basin but we would also want to see what land is available around that to provide the additional facilities that would need to be accommodated um, including car parking and storage we would want to see what the minimum depth of the, the depth of the basin would be with a minimum two meter depth at mean low water this not clear how the entrance to the basin works it looks like there might be a footpath across it which suggests that there would be a lock type type arrangement and I don't think that we we think that that would be appropriate at all you would need unimpeded access to that uh, there's no need for a for a lock arrangement there so if there's a footpath there that would need to be rerouted we'd want to look at the mix of the berths in the basin um, the adopted local policy in the local plan requires 15 percent for something like this so this would give a number of eight uh, visitor moorings out of 50 is that sufficient? Some of this would depend on what the online mooring provision would be, but there are advantages to online mooring, particularly for visitors and those who might not perhaps be skilled in getting into uh, into quite tight marinas. So there would be a there'd be discussions there um, as to the number, the tenure and how they would be managed. Scheduling uh, and delivery of the marina would be essential because that would need to be un that would need to um, be available before the fixed fixed bridges went in to ensure that that facility was available um, at the point at which the navigation became impeded. And I think we would also want to see survey details to confirm that it is achievable to construct a marina there. So we'd want to see some of the some of the geology and some of the uh, some of the some of the services where the gas pipe goes, for example. Um, a lot of these are discussions for stage two and beyond, particularly around the management and the funding. Um, but I think it, your views on those um, mitigation measures uh, 
are, are sought and whether there are additional points that we should be raising as we go through this process. We've had some informal comments back recently from the NSBA and it's worth raising those. They've raised concerns um, that the marina shouldn't become a boat park, um, by which I understand them to mean shouldn't all be private moorings. They have indicated that they would support it being 100% visitor moorings, i.e. it is a visitor marina, um, and that funding should come from the beneficiaries of the fixed bridge. But I think we need to, whilst I understand what they're looking to achieve here, and I, I think you know, so we support in principle their view that we should be looking to maximise the offer here for, for boaters and for visitors. Um, I think we've got to look seriously at what the construction costs of this would be be um, and the running costs and in order for it to be viable and it's essential that it is viable then it's likely that some level of private mooring is going to be required so that you know what you're looking at in terms of the revenue. Um, I'm not convinced that there would be a need that there's the demand for a 50 berth visitor marina, certainly not all year round. There may be points in the summer at which it, it would be attractive. Um, it would then start to impact on the yacht station and why might we be better to look at two facilities so we don't we don't compromise the viability of the yacht station, but people have got the choice of either mooring close, either within the city centre or in a marina outside the centre and making their own way in uh, and using the facilities within this new area um, as an alternative. Um, so there's also the issue of the online moorings um, and what these would offer and if there's potential for maybe 40 or 50 online moorings that is an, that's another offer to, to take into account and we would want to look at, at, the, at the accumulation of it and how best to manage these all together so that we're catering for all, all the needs. Um, demasting moorings, of course, they should be required um, adjacent to any bridges to, to, in, to enable vessels to, to demast. Um, the principle of bridges being fixed, concerns have been raised as to whether or not if we accepted the principle of network rail constructing a fixed bridge here in order to address some of their operational difficulties, whether that would be a transferable principle and whether network rail might want to use that, for example, as an argument to shut Reed and Bridge Summer Leighton Bridge, all, all the other swing bridges that they operate. And I think it's quite important to note here that if we were to accept the principle of a fixed bridge here, it would be very much in response to a specific set of circumstances and very importantly, a specific opportunity. Um, and I don't see that opportunity arising in these other locations. So I don't think that we would even be considering it if we were looking um, at the other swing bridges that Network Rail operate. And for some comfort here, I would remind you of the discussions that are ongoing about Caro Bridge um, and the position of the Broads Authority there, that that bridge needs to open. So in summary, I think this is a welcome I think we can welcome the principle of the redevelopment of the Brownfield land here and the opportunity that it offers. Um, there's, it's very positive to see investment in the river and the role of the river in the scheme and the, and the enthusiasm um, for, um, for taking advantage of this very special opportunity. Um, from the comments so far, the number of the visitor moorings and how they're provided are going to be fundamental um, and the package of mitigation measures. Um, and we're seeking your views on the stage one master plan, the emphasis on the river in the master plan, the provision for navigation that's indicated in the master plan and the principle of the fixed bridges. So thank you very much. Thank you, Callie, and thank you, Graham. Have we got any questions or comments? Harry, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I, I'd just like to say I, I think it's, um, as a native of Norwich, shameful that our bridges don't open easily. Um, I find that uh, in my own in opinion, I think uh, lifting lifting bridges in an urban setting adds to the character and the attractiveness of that setting, as well as aiding navigation. 
And I think every effort should be made to make sure that the navigation is preserved as it exists uh, and improved regarding uh, the bridges that are more difficult to raise. Uh, I noticed that Amsterdam doesn't seem to have a major issue traffic wise generated by the lifting bridges that do lift in Amsterdam over their main waterway. So um, that's my feeling about it. Um, this is an opportunity to make the access to the city better. Uh, and we should be making sure that the lifting bridges, as far as Bishop's Bridge, do lift easily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry. Right, who have we got next? Uh, Leslie? You might be on mute, Leslie. Yeah, I, I am here. I'm having enormous uh, problems with communication. Um, I, 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 I concur exactly with what Harry's saying. Um, it, it's most important that all our bridges are opening. Um, anything that we can do to bring uh, vessels back onto the River Yeah and up into that wonderful place, Norwich, has got to be encouraged. And, and, and I think we've got to do everything in our power to make sure any new bridge open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Excuse me, uh, Chair. Excuse me, Chair. Uh, does uh, Leslie have any declarations to declare? No, I have no declarations. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Cersei. Go on now. Um, Mike. I, I fully endorse Harry's comments. Um, I'd go a little bit further than that, however. If you, if you consider what happened to our railway network with branch lines after beaching, when things are lost, they're lost. And I think the problem we have on the navigation and the broads as a whole is that we are losing areas of water for navigation with certain sizes of boat. Um, it's quite difficult for people to go the other side of Potter Bridge, as an example, um, because you can't guarantee the tide's going to be right or the water level right for your return trip, so you could get stuck there. Similarly, Roxham Bridge this last year has been incredibly difficult for people to navigate be simply because of the water levels being higher. Uh, we've already lost um, Hofton Great Broad. We, we've got the area at Thorpe that most boats can't navigate along because of the heights of the rail bridges there. Um, once you get beyond Beckles Old Bridge, again, there are issues you may risk not getting back. And I think we need to look at the bigger picture, basically. Otherwise, it's going to reach the point where the navigation is so short, you won't be able to get under the bridges at Yarmouth to go from north to south or the opposite way. And it's just not going to be feasible for high boat operators and others to think about it. Um, I'm somebody that's actually cruised as far up the, the navigation through Norwich as it's possible to go up to New Mills. And it's a lovely stretch of river a bit further on. I appreciate how boats aren't really able to go beyond um, Cow Tower or the um, yacht station, whichever way you care to think of it. But uh, the, the concern I have is not the industrial aspect of um, the entrance to Norwich, which I don't think is off-putting to boaters as somebody that's cruised the canal system extensively. We accept that that was a much um, younger navigation than the broads, but equally it was built for the industrial aspect of it. When you get into the city centres, be it London, with what's been happening in the Regent Street, uh, Regent's Canal, or you start looking at even what's happened in Stoke-on-Trent, they've, they've really upped the game there, and the, the industrial heritage comes over really, really well, the same as Gas Street in Birmingham. Um, you, you need to bear in mind that the, the commercial aspects are incredibly important to people because it's part of it. The, people like the experience of seeing the industrial aspects. The council, however, it's, I assume it's the city council, seem quite unwelcoming once you actually get into the city past that initial gateway, 
that we've been talking about with the rail bridge there. Um, the fact there are no mooring signs all along the river where the council presumably own the moorings at Riverside, where people may want to moor because they want to pop over to Morrison's to top up their food and drink supplies. Um, whether you even get beyond the area that hire boats can operate, only go up to Quayside, again, loads of no mooring signs. And people, private boat owners, may well just want a day out so they can pop into the city, buy boat, go and have a meal in a pub or a restaurant, which is easily reached on foot from Quayside, and they're not allowed to moor there. I mean, it's it's farcical, really. You're turning your back on all sorts of opportunities for the businesses. And you say you're trying to be welcoming. I, I just find the whole thing quite, I don't know, paradoxical, I suppose. Um, it. I'm very, very opposed to having fixed bridges. It will just cut it off, particularly as we move further into the area of rising water levels both at sea and across the broads where it will become increasingly difficult to navigate them i think that's about it thanks very much mike uh paul yeah i was just, I was just going to pick up on the fixed bridge i mean I, I kind of get the point um but i mean i do think we need to think about the air draft of the fixed bridge because i mean if you're coming from the northern broads you're going to go through a fixed bridge in any case <laughs> you know, so you know, you, you know, so so you're going to have to go through a fixed bridge if you want to go from Norwich into Northern Broads. So I think we do need to, be, you know, I do, I, I do think I, I agree with the with the with the principle of keeping the navigation open, but I think we need to think about, you know, kind of what who's using it and what we need to keep the navigation open for. And so I think, you know, for me, it's more a question about the air draft. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're not going to sail up there, are right? going from the north to south. But if, if you go north to south, you've still got to go through a fixed bridge. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I understand this entirely. I'm not suggesting that's the only way. It's about the, the total <laughs> restriction of the, north, the, the waterways, whether it's the north broads or the south broads. I think there are real issues in that there is a smaller area available for boaters now. I mean, I, you were talking about the marina. I, I, I certainly yeah. wouldn't choose as a boat owner to moor my boat at Norwich because as a private boat owner, You've got a lot of dead water. You've just got to keep going backwards and forwards over to get anywhere different. Mm -hmm. You then want to go up the Waveney or, or wherever else you might want to go. Ideal, perhaps, for a hire operator to, to take over the marina. Yeah. And we certainly need loads of visitor moorings there. But um, I don't think it's appropriate as, you know, a permanent berth for people. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Stephen Bolts, you've got something to say. Yeah, just a, a simple question. Um, obviously, the issue of bridges and fixed bridges versus raising bridges is key. Um, uh, the, the developers are obviously going to want fixed bridges because of the cost implications, so a network rail, etc. Um, what and when um, would a decision actually be made? And who, more importantly, who would actually have a final say as to what would be required um, with regard to bridges? Because kind of feel with Carrow Road, etc., a sort of early decision as to whether or not it would be required to be raised would have it needs to be made fairly early on in the process rather than you know go right down the line of coming up with proposals and planning applications for fixed bridges or raised bridges so when and when who and how would that decision actually be made i don't know whether either graham or Callie can answer that shall i just make a couple of points here. Um, like I say, the master plan isn't a planning application. It's just an indication of what would be achievable. Um, any decisions on um, whether it would be a fixed bridge or a lifting bridge, that would come in as part of a planning application. The planning application would indicate what was proposed. When we looked at the bridge for the deal ground um, back in 2015, planning permission was granted for that. That was granted as an opening bridge and we set a minimum soffit level on that as 4.2 metres. So that would mean that it was no lower than any of the existing bridges. So anything that can currently get into Norwich could still get into 
Norwich under that bridge. Um, and if we were looking at any fixed bridges, that's the sort of level that we would be thinking about looking at. Um, so it would come in as part of a planning application. I think one of the things that it's useful to think about when we're looking sort of overall at the discussion that we're having here is the marina that has been indicated within the master plan is indicated as a compensation mitigation in effect for putting in for four fixed bridges if the bridges are opening then that's got a considerable um economic that's got a considerable financial implication we will be talking many tens of millions of pounds of additional cost to put those additional bridges in plus any further infrastructure so that would be money that then would not be spent on the on the mitigation because there would be no need for the mitigation and the authority wouldn't have the uh wouldn't have the justification for asking for the mitigation so um i think that's worth bearing in mind can i can i just comment briefly on on the on that chair because um, i think it's a it's a helpful uh, point that uh, kelly has made but i think it was stephen who um made a germane point in terms of his how he asked the question there's a i'm sure there's a whole load of legal technical issues of how you would need to consent both through the planning process and whether there's any implications for the Trouse rail bridge and the current transport and works acts and the navigation rights and all the rest of it there's a whole set of legal challenges and issues that would need to be done to issue the relevant consents for any fixed or indeed lifting bridges as part of this process but I think from my point of view, the key to making this work as a wider strategic project is getting, again, hopefully unanimity of view about what a reasonable position is on these matters and getting it expressed through the master plan, because then you're clear on your funding requirement and this whole exercise is going to need some sense of public subsidy. We don't know quite what the level is, but we will need to be clear to get that money out of government to enable us to go and deliver it. And from my perspective, an ask in relation to a marina, cost of fixed bridges, cost of a substantial mitigation package in terms of demasting improvements to a lot of the upstream moorings that um, we recognise in terms of the River Wensum strategy aren't what they could be and the whole experience of the city not being as welcoming to boaters as it could or should be could be enhanced. I think that whole package could be prepared at a cost that is substantially less than the cost of an alternative with the lifting bridges going along it and I would imagine that's an much easier sell for myself in terms of getting packages of funding agreed with government than an option that includes the lifting bridges option just to come back on Kelly's point if 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 we can't and we're in a position where that that principle of access to the the waterways effectively between Trousbridge and boundary bridge is effectively sacrosanct and needs to be protected for longer term for strategic reasons as far as i see it my case for requiring the marina downstream um, and creating that better interface between the city and the broads and what was illustrated on the utility site that case has all but evaporated if it doesn't obviate the need for the lifting bridges i don't know if that helps can I come back on that then? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, th that's exactly the point I'm kind of making, although maybe the word decision was the wrong word. Um, it seems to me that in order to take this forward, somehow there needs to be consensus between the various parties, including the Lords Authority, um, with regard to what the policy should state, therefore what the funding could be applied for and what the... Um, what was practical and what was not practical. And if, if we end up in a position where which as far as I can see at the moment, we sort of kind of currently are um, and has been expressed by a number of members that we should be looking to 
maintain the, the navigation, the full navigation into the Norwich, then um, the, the whole scheme may or may not be in jeopardy. So it's it's a, it's a, maybe not it's a, maybe decision was the wrong word, but maybe consensus would need to be achieved fairly early on um, in order to get this to go forward. Does that make more sense? That makes that makes a lot of sense to me. As I say, it's not a. I don't think it's a legal requirement, but actually, in terms of maximising the prospect of us being successful at delivering this wider development, getting clarity through the master plan stage about where that consensus view is on this issue would be a real advantage. And whilst I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be waving the white flag or giving up on the prospect of trying to deliver East Norwich if it is a requirement that those bridges have to lift. I think it, it is a pretty major encumbrance. So over the course of the next year, and I certainly don't want to be seen to be bouncing anybody into a premature decision because this isn't something that's resolved instantly, but over the course of the next month or indeed year, it would be helpful to find a way of getting some form of formal resolution as to whether you're comfortable with that principle that's, in, that's sort of coming out of the emerging master plan that marina downstream of the of the lowermost bridge um soffit heights that are higher frankly than the Trans rail bridge currently is and an additional package of mitigation demasting additional mooring points inline moorings whatever they may be are um, is is in principle acceptable um uh, for for the for the loss of the navigation rights for the higher ve vessels to come into Norwich, I think. Okay, thanks, uh, Harry. I think we'll have to take this limit the number of questions now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. It, it, just to say that um, I think the principle of delivering um, boats to the centre of Norwich is more important than having a marina on the outskirts. Um, commercially, uh, convenience-wise, and every so, if the choice is between lifting bridges or a marina, and I don't see why the private sector can't pick up the the, the heavy lifting on a marina anyway, um, I, I, I absolutely go for the lifting bridges. Thanks very much, Harry. Um, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Just to come back on, on Stephen Bolt's point, um, you need to remember that uh, Trous Rail Bridge is, is governed by an Act of Parliament for the opening of, and the same with Carra Bridge, which is under a Corporation Act. So there is a fair amount of legal work that would need to take place with these bridges, and Navigation Committee will be well aware that the Harbour Revision Order that took place on Mutford Lock took nearly 10 years to actually get through and that was a reasonably simple one so um, there is a lot of legal work that needs to take place as well not just within the master plan but outside of that as well great thanks very much rob um i'll just take leslie's question yes yeah. yes yeah. yeah. um i i think any move to restrict access into norwich would in by future generations to be considered an act of vandalism, really. Um, Norwich is the greatest gem on the East Coast for a visiting yacht to come here. Um, I've, I've had people, when I was running my marina downstream, I've had people come from right. Bristol across England and down through London and up this coast to visit Norwich. And I've, I've taken 60 foot Dutch barges right through Norwich, right up to New Mills. People say that's impossible, but I've done it with 30 people on the boat. It's one of the most magnificent trips you can, you can take. I think that if we don't fight absolutely tooth and nail, to keep Norwich open in the hope that one day a council will have the vision to transform that waterside 
into the Venice of the East, then, then it's a very big day for everybody. And, and, and bridges going into any form of mooring will really put a kiss of death on it. You'll just have a white elephant otherwise. You might as well not do it. Go for the opening bridges and develop develop your water cycle. That's what that's what that city needs desperately. Thanks very much, Leslie. Okay, well, we've had some uh, good discussion about everything. For what it's worth, I agree with uh, my fellow members. I'm very much in favour of uh, continuing to have the bridges open. I think Norwich could make more of its port. Uh, I realised it hasn't had commercial use for a couple of decades, but it's been a port since medieval times. So in percentage terms, that's actually quite small. Um, is uh, Leeds up north was sort of defunct for about 20 years. They've just resumed barge traffic there last year. I think they bring about a thousand tons in every week. Uh, each barge takes about 10 lorry loads off the road and uses the amount of fuel that one lorry would use. So there's, there's certainly scope to make more of the river. Um, there's things like the Heritage Harbour Scheme. Um, so yes, I don't think you should necessarily, this development sounds great, but I don't think you should necessarily hinge it on saving money on something that you should be doing anyway. So that's my point of view. Is everyone happy to move on to the next item? Okay, thank you very much, Graham. And uh, thank, thank you very much. If you don't mind, I shall depart now. Thank you, Graham. Thanks thank you for taking part. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye. Right, we're on to uh, agenda item number nine. Take us through. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah. Right, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me. Uh, my, my screen is frozen just at the wrong moment, but I shall uh, keep talking. So, yeah, agenda item nine is the normal progress update from myself. This is only two months really on from the previous report back in September. So there's not a huge amount to report differently this time. Other than that, for the dredging work, so section one in the report, we can report that we've achieved our predicted or our planned annual dredging volume total already. So we managed to get ahead of schedule primarily through extension of time and dredging requirement at Hickling and in the upper Thurn to complete the, uh, the Canapé, mm -hmm. the Cara Bay project. The, the lagoon area we created was took far more or took a considerable more amount of sediment than we calculated. So the, the compaction and the compression and the amount of volume of wet sediment that went into that area uh, was, was greater than we predicted. So we actually spent more time dredging in that area, uh, which has pushed targets on and to completion. In addition, as well, we did spend more time in Alton Broad, um, so that the, these shuffles around in the work program um, were logistical considerations in terms of where the next project was and getting all the equipment together in time. So it was easier to stay dredging where we were and then all, all move in one go. So the, the sort of in-year changes in the dredge program is is a bit like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It does mean that other some other navigation work areas. Um, didn't have as much time spent on them, but if you look at the Appendix 2, you can see we actually spent a little less time than predicted on the water plant cutting. So in any one year, we do tend to work fairly dynamically, adjusting to priorities and the actual situation on the ground. So um, this has been a happy bonus because we managed to keep all the water plant cutting going and we dredged more than we thought. So <laughs> hopefully that's positive news for everyone. Um, and the current dredging we're doing, so now in 2022, uh, we're currently dredging on the River Chet. And today, pretty much, the, all the machinery's moved from Hickling up to Martham. 
So we're dredging now in the, the River Thurn between Martham Ferry up towards Somerton Stave. So those two areas do actually have active uh, restrictions to navigation imposed, but there's information and signs on site for users. The other main bit just to mention to members is the progress we're making uh, with the refurbishment and repiling of commissioners cut 24 hour more. And th this has been a difficult site, should we say, in terms of setting up what we actually can feasibly do there at this location. We had looked at a complete replacement of all the steel and redesigning the site, but the costs of that sort of uh, expensive project, should we say, were just not possible. The cost effectiveness and the, the price of materials currently of all well, the materials prices have skyrocketed, so it just wasn't feasible. Um, so we're now re-tendering and re-specking -re with the contractors who had shown an interest in this work to actually maintain the existing line and strengthen what's already there because this the steel piling is in good enough condition to uh, maintain the existing line, which obviously then gives us better value for money and uh, maintains, will enable that mooring to reopen. Um, so we're now looking to re-tender -re for that work and try and do the work later in the spring. So at the moment, Commissioner's Cut remains closed until we can actually get a, an affordable solution worked out there. And in terms of other items in the report, that is pretty much it, really, unless there are questions. So I'm happy to take those now. Uh, Mark. Yes, have you managed to get back up to Gettleston to do the arm up to Rowan Craft? Because that got missed off with the dredging last time. The other thing is in, um, in a follow up to Leslie's comment about taking a 60 foot Dutch barge up to New Mills, He'd be able to do that now. He wouldn't be able to turn it round there because effectively uh, the, there's a cut channel where the water comes over the weir and, and comes on down. But, but there wouldn't be the depth of water to actually turn a boat there now, not of the kind of size that, that we're talking about with a 60-foot Dutch barge. Uh, so, yeah, the first question then, Mike, was about the Galston cut, sherry cut, uh, so going down towards Roundcraft. We, no, you're right. We didn't quite manage to. We would manage. To, we filled up the available lagoon space prior to actually getting that far into the uh, up the river. One of the curious items here, uh, and I'm glad you've raised it, Mike, because this is a good question to test the water for the navigation committee members. The actual Broads Authority's limited navigation is halfway down the Sherry Cut, so it's not all the way to Rowan Craft. So beyond the authority's navigational responsibility is about half of that dike length and certainly to the bridge and within the basin at Rowancraft. They're not the authority's responsibility. We have in the past, and historically we've always applied the uh, the, the water plant harvester, you know, we've, we've, we've cleared the water plants beyond our navigational limit. And this was back in the days when water plants weren't particularly common in, in the main rivers. And that area is one of the few places, a bit like Somerton, that did actually have yeah. water plants present. So we've, we've constantly maintained that area, even though technically it's outside of what we would consider the authority's yeah. navigational responsibility, It'd be like going into an adjacent water. So whilst we've historically managed that area, the question now remains, would we actively in the future, with all of the other pressures and demands and other priorities, particularly for water plant cutting and for dredging, would the authority choose to effectively maintain uh, what is an adjacent water? So there's a bit of a, a quandary there for us, uh, particularly with the, that area, Mike, that you've raised that we, we didn't extend into and dredge this time round. The question is, would we in the future? Uh, well, it's certainly tidal there because I, I grounded when the tide went out and it nearly tipped my boat over because I have a keel. <laughs> so, yeah, the tidal issue is one thing. It's whether it's within the authority's boundary for navigation management is, is a slightly separate discussion. So 
Ooh. Perhaps th this needs a bit more expl exploration and need to provide the evidence in terms of the mapping and the previous documentation. But it's it's one of those areas where the authority has historically done something, but where now if we were to reconsider, would we choose to do in the future? Um, so perhaps that's something I will come back to members about. Um, and then your second point, you raised, Mike, was about the width of available river space up in the New Mills Basin. Uh, again, I don't have the hydrographic data to hand. Uh, the waterway specification would be set out in the, the document we saw back in September, which was the waterways management strategy. Uh, yes, a 60-foot barge might be slightly longer than what's potentially possible now. Um, the, the other question is, would we dredge New Mills Basin to accommodate a mythical 60-foot Dutch barge, um, if anyone would like to get one up there? Uh, so again, it's we, we have a specification that covers, say, 95% of users' needs. That over and above might be beyond what we would normally include as a standard specification. <laughs> That's great. OK, thanks very much. Um, quick question, Dan. The uh, total volume dredge this year is about 24,000 cubic metres this year. Is, I know people love to look at things like that. Yeah. Uh, so certainly in terms of volume, it's less than in previous years. But the report that we would normally do annually uh, is all about the compliance with the waterway specifications on a spatial basis. So we've been targeting the dredging where it would have most benefit to users where areas of river or broad are shallow. So we could we could go in and dredge huge volumes, but it had very little benefit for users, or we could target areas where actually people complain about and it causes issues for navigators, like anyone who might want to go up to the Gelderton Cut. Um, so uh, I think the waterways management strategy helped set this out. It's a bit of a change in mindset. It's not just just chasing volumes isn't the only thing to consider. It's actually where that dredging has the biggest bang for our buck, basically. So spatially is just as important as uh, the volume. That's great. Uh, That's great. Thanks. Thanks for... Uh, before we move on, uh, we've got three items left, is, but we've been for hours now. Does anyone need to take a break? I'm not anticipating that the last three items are going to be particularly lengthy. Could be wrong. Are you guys all happy to carry on? A thumbs up. Brilliant. OK, thanks very much, Dan. Um, right, if we move on to item number which is the draft budget and financial strategy. I'll let uh, Emma take us through that. Good afternoon. Thank you. So the report covers two items. So the first part of the report covers items up to uh, actual up to the end of November. And table one on page 34 shows an actual variance of £344,488. Just under 50% of that variance relates to the increase in toll income. And then the remainder of that variance relates to the fact that we'd budgeted for a 2% pay increase. And um, members may be aware we're subject to the um, NJC negotiations on the authority's behalf, and those negotiations for 21 22 have stalled. So, no pay increase has been implemented at this date. The other part of that variance also relates to the fact that we've had delays in replacing vehicles. And this is due to the fact that the authority wants to move to a greener fleet and that these vehicles. The electric vehicles require chips and there's a national shortage of chips so when we order a new vehicle there's looking like a six to seven possibly longer month uh, delay in that vehicle being delivered so that's part of the reasons for those variances just to give you an update so at the end of december toll income was 184,000 above the budget and the report shows the forecast we were at the end of November that we were predicting was to be 189,000 above, but current predictions suggest that this could be as much as 195,000. 
There's no further update on the December expenditure figures at this date as we're just catching up from Christmas. Before I move on to the budget part, does anybody have any questions on the actual figures for me? No. Nope. Okay, so the draft budget starts at the bottom of page 37 and it incorporates the 3.6% in, increase in tolls that was agreed by Board's Authority before Christmas. Paragraph 6.3 on page 38 highlights the relevant factors taken into consideration. And as I mentioned previously, pay, the expectations for pay is a difficult one to forecast. And this is further impacted in 2022-23 by the introduction of the social health care levy that's been implied applied to national insurance. So currently staff make up 62% of the navigation side of the budget so you can see that pay negotiations can have a big impact on the budget. Also inflation and cost of energy continue to increase and at the Nove end of November the CPI was 4.6% and continues to rise and December's will not be available till the 19th of January. Members may also recall for the 21-22 budget, we'd forecast that 20 high boats would be removed from the fleet, but this did not happen during the year, hence why we've ended up with such a favourable variance on toll income. But what we have reflected in this year's budget is that further boats will be removed based on the information shared by the high boat companies. So table five on page 39 sets out a high level overview of the budget while Appendix 3 on page 58 breaks it down by summary level. It then proceeds on to page 39 and breaks it down by directorate. So operation has seen an increase in due to the rising cost of material. And also members may be aware that the tax rate on red diesel is about to increase from the 1st of April, as well as the salary increases incorporated. The increase to the high boat officer that members agreed before Christmas. Strategic services, and you may notice that it still says Chief Executive Directorate, but that has now been renamed. So its first outing of its new name is Finance and Support Services, has also had salary increases and the strengthening of the finance and tolls team. Page 1441 shows the split between central costs and navigation shares remains broadly the same for anyone to 22 and 2223. Section 11 on page 42 sets out the key assumptions and the sensitivity analysis. And I think one thing to still highlight is that obviously on the national park side of the budget, we still are waiting for our national park grant settlement, although that is hoped that we may have some information end of the month, beginning of February. Section 12, um, paragraph 12.3 sets out the planned expenditure from reserves for 22-23. For the years 23-24 onwards, these will be updated next year. Members may be concerned by the deficit budget for navigation. However, this is balanced through the use of reserves as these remain above our minimum level. If you refer to the appendix, you will notice by the end of year three, this should return to a surplus budget, although I I must highlight that the future level of charges and expenditures will be refined when we come to budgeting from t for 23-24 onwards. I don't know if anybody has any questions for me. Thanks very much, Emma. Does anyone have any questions? No, nope, it's all very good. Thank you very much. Um, OK, if we can move on to item number 11 now, which is the Association of Inland Navigation Authorities uh, code for the design, construction, operation of hire boats. I think Linda is going to be taking us through this. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone. To make the uh, members um, aware of the new hire boat code. Uh, hire boat code was first introduced in 2009, and we since then we now have a new version, uh, which now comes into force from the 1st of January this year. Um, the hire boat code sets out 
principles um, for the operation of all types of higher craft to members of the public and, and makes clear the responsibilities of each of the parties involved, i.e. the higher high boat operators and also the navigation authority. Um, high boat licensing review um, we are changing the way that we uh, carry out um, our licensing audits and introducing a risk-based approach using a traffic light system the high boat code is obviously mandatory to licensing authorities and uh, we will be working with uh, high boat operators um, to um, inform them of the requirements of the high boat code and, and how that may affect them. And, and obviously the high boat code mirrors the licensing conditions. The new, the new version um, provides improvements um, to stability and, and also handover. Uh, handovers so that there is some slight changes there. Um, uh, it's been slow coming into force um, because uh, obviously the MAIB were carrying out an investigation um, in regarding to the fatality in 2020 and wish to uh, look at the impl implementation of the new code and um, and obviously to provide any advice and based on that advice um, we now have this um, may I take any questions that anyone may have um, in regards to the new version thanks anyone No? Okay, I think that's pretty good. Thank you very much for that, Linda. Um, and staying with you, Linda, item number 12 on the agenda uh, is Powerboat Racing Review for 2022. You could take us through that, please. Um, obviously, uh, 2020 high boat um, racing um, was carried out, um, which, which was really good. Um, the year before, it wasn't because um, obviously with COVID. Um, it was very good racing. Um, throughout the, the racing event, there were seven incidents. Um, four resulted into minor injuries and one resulted into hospital, hospital treatment on the um, we received a complaint regarding the, the incident and the, um, the uh, Lowestoft and Alton Broad Motor Boat Club, uh, i.e. Peter Mandrip, carried out a full investigation and, and submitted that to the MAIB and the MAIB was satisfied um, with, with the content of the report. Um, may I take any questions in regarding my report? Thanks, Linda. Has anyone got any questions for Linda? Not seeing any, so all right. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end, item number 13, other matters, and that's just to note the date of the next meeting, which is the 14th of April at uh, 10 o'clock. If I remember rightly, there's one other thing, Linda Asplund, I think it's her birthday or close to it. Um, I know we're hoping to meet in person and have, have cakes, but uh, we wish you a happy birthday instead. <laughs> <laughs> You're on Thank mute, you Linda. Thank you very much, Matthew. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks very much, everybody. It's been a, a long and interesting meeting, but uh, quite, uh, quite useful. And um, we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>